Our good friend C.S. Lewis is back on the show today, as is Mr. Bill Donahue. I'll be right back. Hey there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike from thegraciousguest.org here with you on another episode of The Gracious Guest Show. And uh, before we get into anything, I just want to remind you, please go ahead to make sure and subscribe to this YouTube channel, like this video, share it far and wide. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. And uh, if you're listening via podcast, please go ahead and uh, do all those things as well. You know, give me a good uh, review over there if you could, wherever you're getting this from, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, basically everywhere you can find podcasts, you can find The Gracious Guest Show. So if you're, you know, driving or you're somewhere, or, you know, you're a big podcaster, not a big YouTuber, I try to get this content for you in a couple of different ways so you can uh, follow along wherever you're at and, and share far and wide. So uh, please do that if, if you'd be so kind. I really appreciate it. Um, this is exciting because today we're diving back into the topic uh, of eschatology, which is a topic that comes up from time to time on uh, the program here. And just to kind of recap this for you in case you're, you're new or uh, you haven't really heard that word before, you're not familiar with it, eschatology uh, is related to the, the Greek term uh, eschaton, uh, two Greek terms actually, and logos, right? You know, so when you think of like ology for, you know, pretty much anything, what it tends to mean the study of, right? Or, or a focus on like biology, focus on biological life, you know, meteorology, uh, archaeology, these, these different studies or, or uh, human endeavors that attempt to focus in on a you know, particular thing. Well, eschatology is a ology of the eschaton. It's a term in Greek that has to do with the last things. Uh, the uttermost, the furthest end, the, the sort of uh, finish line. And so when we talk about eschatology in a Christian context, we're really focusing on uh, everything related to death, judgment, uh, hell, heaven. Uh, we get into purgatory, certainly from a, from a Catholic perspective. We talk about uh, purgatory, which is um, very, very biblical. It's, it's a very, very ancient uh, belief. It actually goes back into ancient Judaism, um, and it's, it's something that uh, the church has fleshed out over the centuries. And really, the short version is that purgatory, the Catholic Church officially uh, teaches, is a, a really a word, a term that we give to a purging. That's You see the related uh, notion there of purging, purgatory. The, the purging away, the washing away, the final cleansing of uh, all of the effects of our sins, really, for those who have died in friendship with God. So in other words, uh, purgatory is not a do-over. It's not a second chance after death. It's sometimes painted that way. But the Catholic Church is very clear that um, if you die in right relationship with God, right, justified uh, in, in uh, right relationship with God, you have not fundamentally rejected God, uh, which would be what hell is, right? We'll get to that more later. Um, but you're not, you know, like, let's say it happens at the last moment of your life, and it's a sincere repentance, a sincere conversion to God. Well, the accumulated effects of those sins you've committed up to that point are real, right? and, and they, they need to be cleansed, they need to be dealt with, they need to be healed. Uh, analogy I like to use sometimes that I've heard years ago is, you know, if you put a, a, a nail into a board, and you pull the nail out, that's like the sin being forgiven, right? Like that nail, there's that sin, whatever that is. And I give that to God. I, I, I genuinely repent. God removes that nail, right? It's gone. He has forgiven me of my sin, but the hole's still in the board. And so we would say that the repair work of, rep of patching that, that hole, now that that detriment is gone, would be something of, of what is, is occurring in what we call purgatory. So it, it's more of a, seems to be more of a, uh, a process a state of existence rather than a, a place you go, per se. So eschatology takes a look at that, takes a look at heaven, hell. What does it mean to be in the glory of heaven for all eternity? There's a lot of different takes on that across the, broadly speaking, the Christian world. Um, and so this you know, program is, is, is an ecumenical uh, program here. I, I want everybody to be able to get something out of it, but, you know, no shame admitting, and it's not something I hide. I'm profoundly Catholic. I'm an absolutely uh, essentially committed card-carrying member of the Catholic Church. I'm never going to change that. I'm convinced it's, it's the fullness of, of uh, the truth that God has given to us. Um, so when we look at eschatology, 
um, there's a lot of things we could focus on. And, uh, but another way we can do it is to see how it's been expressed through um, literature, through film, through different uh, sort of uh, fictional depictions of these things. And I think some of these are, as to be expected, better than others. Or I should say some are more accurate than others, according to the truth that God has revealed. And ironically enough, my favorite uh, sort of fictional eschatological, uh, you know, guide in a lot of ways is none other than C.S. Lewis, which is interesting because Lewis wasn't Catholic. That being said, Lewis's eschatological descriptions in a lot of his work, I think, is far more Catholic sometimes <laughs> in, in its sensibilities um, than some of, of the things you might find occasionally out there in, in, uh, in, in Catholic circles where there might be some confusion over what the church really teaches. Uh, so, I thought, who better to bring on the show to kind of take a look at at some of these last things depictions, right? Especially, you know, purgatory, heaven, hell, um, but, you know, death and judgment in there as well. Uh, wanted to bring on my friend Bill Donahue. Then Bill's been on the show before. I've, I've interviewed Bill over the years a number of times. Uh, I consider him a dear friend. He's, he's a, a, just a, a wonderful person to talk to all around. Uh, Bill is a, a senior lecturer and a content specialist at uh, the Theology of the Body Institute, which uh, does a lot of just profound, uh, wonderful work unpacking and, and disseminating and training people in the church in uh, Pope John, Pope St. John Paul II's uh, teaching, uh, his really body of teaching uh, over many, many years called the Theology of the Body. And, and the central thesis of which is that God has made us in our incarnational way as, as body and soul together uh, because that's how he's made us, our very bodies and our bodily existence uh, bears with it a, a, a powerful and profound theology that God wants to communicate theologically through our very bodies. So they do a lot of wonderful work that, that delves into a lot of the incredibly, increasingly important um, the considerations regarding human sexuality, uh, what our, our sexuality is, is for, what it actually is, and in an, in an age that is just desperately uh, confused and, and terribly misguided in so many ways about those things, uh, Theology of the Body Institute's work is, is perhaps more important than ever before. So, uh, so that's, if you want to check out Bill, I'll, I'll give some links below for the Theology of the Body Institute. You can check out their fantastic work. Uh, but for now, without further ado, let's jump into this discussion of The Last Things and C.S. Lewis. Take a look. All right, Bill Donahue, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being my gracious guest today. You're most gracious in, in welcoming me as your gracious guest. Thank you, Mike. Well, it's, yeah, it's always a pleasure, and especially whenever we, we look at C.S. Lewis or, or Tolkien, like these guys come up quite a bit, of course. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we spoke, of course, uh, I think last time you were on, we were specifically looking at uh, the, I almost called it the Space Trilogy. <laughs> For, for Boaten. <laughs> We've both the, been cured of right. that. We've both yeah, been the, cured the, of that. Thanks the Ransom you. Trilogy, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so uh, but today I just, I had this idea, uh, you know, where we're, um, at the time of this recording, we haven't done the, the show we want to do on, on C.S. Lewis and the idea of first things, which is, you know, kind of a broader topic, but that got me thinking about the last things, because I have that coming up in a course I'm teaching here pretty soon, um, and with... Uh, with homeschool connections as well, you know, I have a, a course I teach over there for, you know, that topic, something that I didn't set out to do, but it's just kind of routinely come up so much. And so it's an area that yeah. I continue to don't consider myself an expert, but like I tend to get more questions and dig in. And there's certain things that jump out at me in fiction. And, and when I see mm. it done right, I feel like, yeah, that seems right. Or you see it, something's a little off. So I thought we could take a look today at just, uh, you know, some, some, bullet points basically of like heaven hell purgatory as we see them especially in the great divorce but maybe a little bit in the last battle sure. as well um sure. so i don't know if it just maybe first things first maybe i could ask you rather um how this affected you or this lewis's vision of these these uh, aspects uh, of of our destiny how did they really hit you when you first started encountering them yeah i i think the great divorce is just the masterpiece when it comes to that those those last things uh he in you know his uniquely gifted way, he concretizes these spiritual realities or concepts. He gives them flesh. You know he humanizes them in such a powerful way. I think better than any other writer I've ever encountered. Hmm. You know, so he's he's just an expert at connecting the known to the new, or showing that um, there really isn't a disconnection. You know, you know heaven, hell, purgatory. As he states in The Great Divorce somewhere, um, 
it's sort of the already not yet. Mm. It's presently here, right? What's what's the distance to heaven, hell, or purgatory? It's a thin veil, really. It's it. it Saint Catherine of Siena once said, it, "It can be heaven all the way to heaven." I think C.S. Right. Lewis would agree with, would agree with that. You know that it's present now here, right? So he he, he helped me to see that. I think uh, he helped me. To, he helped me to see how real it is. Sure. How real it is. Is that something too? That reminds me a little bit. I didn't have that bookmarked here, but uh, and I was I was telling you before <laughs> before we started mm. recording. I just came back from the eye doctor, so like my eyes are getting over being dilated. So like. Like I'm like holding the book like this too, but I, I I do remember since I just went through this recently, though I can't remember exactly where it is. It's somewhere around the middle or getting into the last third maybe. But when mm-hmm. he's talking to George McDonald, um, yeah. and I'm assuming if you're watching this, you've probably read The Great Divorce, or if you're listening to this, if not, definitely go go read it. It's um, it's a, a marvelous book where C.S. Lewis imagines these phantom like, you know, human characters who are really kind of ghosts. Um, essentially getting sort of a tour of the front, you know, steps, the front porch, essentially, of, of, of heaven. Um, mm. Not so much, and it's, it's, it's kind of mystical, right? Like, it's, it's not so much that they're being given a second chance. It's, they're already dead, but there's somehow this interplay of, of, like, there's, you know, the playing out of their ultimate decision that they did make in life, you know, and that this, if there's still anything left in them that can be fanned into flame... Right. The angels, the saints, you know, God Himself will, will do that. But it's it's yeah. these these windows into these characters' uh, attitudes, their sin tendency, their their addiction, whatever it is, in just a really compelling way. And McDonald yeah. makes that point about like you know, in heaven, all will have been heaven. If you end up in hell, it, it's it's almost like he says it's retroactive, almost, or it works. Backwards. Yeah, actually, I, since I have uh, my. I haven't been to the eye doctor today and I have my glasses on. I can read the exact paragraph. Please do. If you'd like, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, Absolutely. That's how we're helping each other out, brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but to the point, though, for those maybe fresh to this and haven't read the book, it is really, it's just such a masterpiece. And, you know, to confirm everything you just said, it is this kind of modernized divine comedy. You know, it's, it's right. Dante's coming from the Inferno up to Paradiso. And right. uh, instead of meeting Beatrice when he reaches the, the heights of heaven, he encounters George MacDonald, who is this Scottish uh, pastor for a little right. time, Scottish you know writer, poet, really. And George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis has been clear in saying that this man who died in the 1800s um, influenced everything he did and really just mm. uh, informed his whole creative spirit. So George MacDonald, it's fitting, becomes his guide when he – He's kind of on the edge of the blessed realm here. So, so here's the uh, the passage. Um, C.S. Lewis, of course, is the is the first person here, kind of describing this whole scene, and uh, he's asking about um, heaven and hell and and these choices. And he, his George MacDonald, his guide says, it depends on the way you're using the words. If they leave that gray town behind, it will not have been hell. To any that leaves it, it is purgatory. Interesting, right? The Protestant C.S. Lewis using this uh, very Catholic term, purgatory. Right. Perhaps, perhaps he'd better not call this country heaven, not deep heaven, you understand. Here he smiled at me. You can call it the valley of the shadow of life. I love that play on uh, Psalm 23, right? Yeah. Yet to those yeah. who stay here, it will have been heaven from the first. And you can call mm. those sad streets in the yonder the valley of the shadow of death. To those who remain there, they will have been in hell, even from the beginning. So again, to, to confirm, like it's kind of your, it's it's the already not yet, mm-hmm. and we encounter people like that in life, right, Mike? People who have that radiant joy, and they're in the life of grace, and you're like, wow, you're kind of already sort of a saintly person, and I'm really drawn to you. Mm-hmm. And we meet conversely people who seem to be already in the desperation and desolation of hell. They right. just seem to wear it. And you're like, wow, your your afterlife is already beginning now. <laughs> well, right, that's and I'm glad you said it that way because it's like. <clears throat> It's not so much because I think the destiny thing, fate versus freedom, like Peter Crave has a wonderful talk, of course, uh, <laughs> on this, <laughs> this idea of fated and free and how we're, we're somehow both, you know, that, that we have this, this destiny, but that's yeah. not the same as a, a predestiny in terms of like, it's already done and my choices now don't matter one way or the other. They absolutely do, but mm. it's, it's just mysterious. And I, I think we don't like that answer, that it's mysterious. It sounds yeah. like kicking the can, but it's... No, mm-hmm. it's it's that you're so you look at someone like John Paul II and who uh, you know you I know you got to 
meet him and be in his presence, love him, right? Love him, love him. Yep. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, I've got and, a portrait um, of him right here behind me on my. There wall. you go. Yep. And and so I I never had the pleasure, but just growing up, you know, with with him being my pope all those years and just seeing, and as I've come to know more about his story and and become a, a bit of a, I don't want to say connoisseur, but a, definitely an enthusiast. Um, it's not so much about him, right? It, it's that he mm. he in his humility and obedience to God becomes consistently more and more this this channel or this window you could say right into yeah, yeah. what heaven is right the kinds of the way that we talk to each other and treat each other you know and yeah. then versus you look at someone like a like a hitler or you know someone of just uh, historic kind of evil that we tend to think of and it's just it's like it's almost this incarnation of a yes. disordered humanity uh, you know <laughs> which we yeah. all we all have in us but you don't have to choose it Right. You know, like it's right. But if you right. keep choosing it, it's like you're insisting on bringing this hell here, um, mm. uh, which where yeah. was it that says that we, we summoned death, that chilling line from Scripture. You know, I think it's in is that in Proverbs or in Sirach oh, wow. or so, I forget where. But that that chilling notion that we and you know, that we yeah. summoned death. Yikes. And to your point, like it becomes it's it gets humanized. It gets incarnated. So which is the is the end of heaven. Right. That's a glorification of our bodies, our bodies. We are body and soul composite. So mm -hmm. either there'll be this radiant heavenly joy coming out of our bodies, as we see in one of the glorious scenes from The Great Divorce, right? Sarah Silvers from Golders Green, the woman mm -hmm. who is in that great that great uh, procession, and she's just this common, ordinary lady. But mm -hmm. she's coming out of her body. And then you see it in figures like the... Um, the scene in the great divorce of the of the dwarf with the with the tall sort of puppet that he's handling yeah. and he's an actor you know and it's it's really, <laughs> he's the shriveled little guy and and so he he embodies what hell is isolation ugliness uh, a divorce yeah. and um she and other characters image integration beauty uh kindness and i think you know when you talk about like heaven hell purgatory it's all about, and this choice, like it is all about for all these characters in The Great Divorce, what am I going to do with myself? Mm -hmm. and all the characters that kind of want to grasp, cling, hold on to themselves, wither, decay, become shadows and wisps. Those who are saying like, it's not about me. I finally realize it and give themselves. It's a very John Paul II thought, right? Self-giving, self-donation. That's when they become radiant. That's when they find their, their true right. humanity. They become solid people, right? In the in the great yeah. divorce, the solid people. I love how even like you see, it's. I love how incarnation. This is like the understatement forever, or you know, the, but how incarnational <laughs> God is, how sacramental God is, just in His creation, right? And how, mm -hmm. you know, the imagery of something like you know, just right, right in Israel, that you have, the 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 beautiful you know sort of uh, life sustaining uh, Sea of Galilee, which mm -hmm. has you know the ability to receive and to give, right? You know, like the, the, it has an outflow, it has inflow, you know, but then the Dead Sea that doesn't really have any outlet, any outflow, oh, it's just wow. all into it. And it's just this dead, salty, completely mm -hmm. lifeless, you know, body of water. And it's it's just like, what are the odds of you having both of those bodies of water on either <laughs> end of this important place, you know? Yeah. But that's yeah. that. I think that sounds like what you're saying too here with the, the, these characters that have, so the characters who are, either seemingly just locked in hell or they're heading that way that that's all that that's a common thing they all seem to have is it's just yeah all about them and even the one remember the one character is they, they they try to get her at one point to something to the effect of could you at least try you know just for a moment to think of something other than yourself <laughs> but it's it's not yes. a it's, it's almost silly it's, it's, a, it's not a judgmental yeah. and this character is so serious and so oh, self-righteous and the the, the heavenly like inviter is like, could you could you try just yeah. for a second like, to not just think head. of yourself? <laughs> and isn't that the best? That's the main message of the whole book, The Great Divorce. I think is, uh, it's not about you. And once mm. you realize that, that's when radical freedom happens. I love that scene. I think it's the same scene of the woman who just can't stop talking about herself, where the 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 shining spirit, the shining solid person, says. Um, Okay, last resort, and blows the horn, and a herd of unicorns come stamping right. through, and just she's like, Wah! and she just bolts, and uh, I think it was George McDonald says to C.S. Lewis, "This may be the only thing that works." Right. For just a second <laughs> that she just stops thinking about herself, you know, a herd of unicorns yeah. is charging at me. That could be the small sliver that God uses to say, "Okay, you know, here comes sweet liberation." 
I just mm-hmm. love that theme. It, it, I, I need yeah. to hear that. I need to hear this call yep. out of me and into the bigger, broader picture of the well, other. There's, there's, some, there's an intimacy, too, that I really love with it, where like we get along with Lewis this this trip through these these interactions and we get to see these and like we're the, you know you're the fly on the wall but there's the one I think it's the one with the woman who's so desperately trying like she misses her son so much and like with all oh, of them yeah. like it's so relatable I mean I've I've never you know lost a son you know but but it's like mm-hmm. as I'm reading it it's amazing just how how carefully how how um patiently and, and, and masterfully he takes you through this per, this reflection to the point where you can see like whoa yikes actually mm-hmm. it's not about her son it's about her it's about control yeah. it's about you know and yes. you're like wow but then like wow. i think it's that scene where mcdonald kind of peels him away like they leave and they they give yeah. those two their moment and and he just mm-hmm. hints that like you know there this might still work out yet but this idea that yeah we've listened in but now we need to there's some privacy here. And I just thought that was right. an interesting sort of way to go about that. Yeah, there's another one of the key words, right? It's, it's either we're obsessed with ourselves or we're obsessed with control. I guess in a certain way, it's the same thing. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's me, my stuff. When the whole, um, the whole of joy comes through selflessness, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I am not worried about myself anymore. I'm finally free. You see the solid people or the shining spirits um, laughing a lot, right? Mm-hmm. They have complete freedom. They, they're transparent. They have no shame. In right. fact, now they realize how ridiculous it all was. Uh, there's the one ghost who is so embarrassed to step out of the bushes because they'll see me. Right. And the, the other shining spirit is like, yeah, we all see everything. Who cares? You know, just right. that radical freedom. Um, yeah. Which again, I mean, C.S. Lewis wrote somewhere, um, I forget exactly where, but he said the whole point of our life is to break out of the small prison of ourselves. Like that's mm. the whole point of a human life is to get out of this little prison. Um, yeah. And it's so sad that uh, so many, it seems like many of the characters in The Great Divorce don't exactly get the transformation. We're kind of all cheering like, well, come on, come on, say yes, say yes, get out of your head. But it seems like they kind of shrivel. Mm. Um, and how interesting, uh, I was just going through it again. And, um, as McDonald reveals to, to the character of CS Lewis, the narrator, how they're actually becoming smaller. You yeah. Know, the solid people are massive and the, the world, you know, every blade of grass, yeah. the trees, the waterfall are huge and hell could fit, you know, hell is the size of an atom. Right. You know, yeah. this obsession with ourselves, me, 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 but you're actually just, you're, you're actually almost nothing. And right. the more selfish you become, the less you become. It's like the yeah. deprivation of the good. That's something McDonald stuff. McDonald says that point in there somewhere specifically that, you know, something to the effect of that the, the whole challenge of, of, you know, fighting with evil and, and kind of working through this is that, you know, the thing that you're fighting against, the thing that you're, you're attempting to redeem, um, or the, the thing that's holding you back from redemption, this evil, this sin, is, is so nearly next, it's so nearly nothing. Like it's just, mm. it's such a empty, impossibly uh, small sniveling kind of thing, and that's like we see, of course, the yeah. that uh, red lizard of, of lust, you know, who gets oh, my favorite. smashed what and my favorite. yeah, it's so incredible. And then uh, you know, as it then transforms and turns into this this beautiful stallion, and and that, that I love, I always love that particular image because maybe talk a little bit about this or just your take on mm. this. This notion that yeah. that that <clears throat> sin, that evil, those those things, you know, whatever we're, we're addicted to or fixated on, a lot of times the fight, which never really works, if you just try to white knuckle it from the standpoint, whatever it is, white knuckle yeah. it from the standpoint of I have to fight this thing, this urge. Well, that urge, that thing, isn't evil necessarily. Like it's 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 something right. good in you that's trying to find its correct orientation or its correct sort of flourishing yes, and, yes. and the problem isn't the the urge or the desire necessarily itself most of the time it's it's what it's it's attached to that's keeping it from being what it's meant to be maybe what do you think about that a little yeah bit? yeah absolutely because this ties into you're, you're trying to frame or maybe our chat here with you know hell purgatory heaven yeah and it really has to do a lot with this what jp2 and others would call eros Arrows, the Greek word for passion. So this is the fire. And that scene with the lizard, the little lizard, is is sort of this withered image of what what Eros could be. It's mm. an inverted, self-seeking, hedonistic Eros. 
And uh, so in comparison to what it can become, it's, it's, it's just laughable. It's almost embarrassing. And in fact, the ghost who has this lizard on his shoulder is embarrassed. You know, I know his stuff can't do it right. here. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll just try to, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, he's falling asleep. You know, he's just constantly rationalizing. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Um, or the, and the angel trying to kill it. He's like, well, I, wanna, I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to, you know, you yeah. guys are busy. It's like, a good point. I'll talk to my doctor and come right. back on Tuesday. <laughs> I'll get another like, opinion. <laughs> Again, okay. that language of rationalizing our own misguided oh arrows, that's, that's just, you know, we do that all the time. But yeah. to, to the point here, right, you're ref- referencing this passion, this fire. Uh, John Paul II writes in, I think, Love and Responsibility, 1960, he says, hmm. the sexual urge is like a vector of aspiration on which our whole existence moves. Like hmm. this is meant to be the outward gift of self like that's why the fire is in us when it goes in for me that's when it becomes that pale wisp of a thing as he says in the great divorce right that's what Mm -hmm. lust is but if you surrender it and let it go and it goes the the, you know the way of the parable of the seed it must be broken and fall then that that vector of aspiration that passion that arrows becomes the stallion right and it's amazing because then the shining spirit he transforms into a real man and is able to ride on that stallion into, you know, the everlasting dawn. And right. uh, that's that's also like this hierarchy, right? I'm not led by my passions into a, a, a myopic sort of selfish life. My passions now, I I lead, I'm steering this horse, right? right. It's the hierarchy of the of the intellect and the will over the lower passions. Right. But the lower passions aren't embarrassing; they're right. the fuel. It's that stallion that gets him up into the everlasting morning. So sure. uh, what a great way to, to reveal the integration of eros and ethos, right? Passion and purity right? coming from C.S. Lewis in a visual narrative way that you just, you just can't forget it. Like, wow, that's, oh, yeah. that's what I've got to do with my passion. I, I get selfish. I got to make it selfless. And being right. Christian is not being passionless. Being no. a Christian or a Catholic is being a fire, right? Yeah, uh, a flame. Uh, and an analogy I like to use a lot, and it comes up in my class when we talk about uh, uh, angels and demons. You know, just there's one particular point where I'm trying to clarify some of that, and, and hopefully get beyond some of the um, the caricatures. You know, that that yeah. uh, we, I think we all battle with, right? Just because of a lot of the pop culture depictions of that that kind of stuff. And um, mm-hmm. I don't remember. I, I I'm sure I I didn't come up with this concept because i think it's kind of obvious you know once you just sort of study what the church teaches about angels and demons but i i i do think i i don't remember specifically hearing this analogy i guess is what i'm trying to say if i if i'm stealing this from someone forgive me but (laughs) i'm using it a lot and if i know who you are i'll give you credit but i I often explain to my kids because i'm trying to get them to understand how angels and demons are sort of ontologically the same kind of creature right like Mm -hmm. to start there and say like this is they start off as the Mm -hmm. same thing yeah. And then through the through the abuse of the will and the intellect, these ones become basically something else. But and it's a permanent you know change. But they still have those same a lot of you know basically the same faculties, and that's why they're so dangerous, etc. That kind of thing. So as I set that up, I, I kind of build up to the image of a beautiful uh, roaring fire and like a ski lodge. You know, just like an angel is like this incredibly huge, massive, burning, you know, like mm. Christmas fire, right, in, in the lodge, mm. and it's providing light and warmth and all this, and it's just a, a marvel to look at, and you're not afraid, but it's it's a sense of, like, wow, right? You're but drawn like, to it. Right, and I'm like, and that's, like, an angel, because it's basically where it's meant to be, <laughs> and mm. it's doing exactly what it's meant to do, but if you grab a log out of the same fire and just throw it on the carpet, and it just yeah. chaos ensues, and it's just... It's the same power, right? But but it's completely mm. in its case. It's not an inanimate thing, though. It's it's a willing, rational creature that's decided to do that to itself. It's malicious, yeah. knowing that right, knowing the toll it's going to take. Mm. So I, sometimes I see them react to that idea of of again, like why you know we so we have all of us are fundamentally created good, right? In God's image and likeness, but we can destroy ourselves. We can destroy our humanity. We can destroy yeah. our. Uh, the, the, the the love and commitment that he gave us to show to others. We can destroy, I almost wonder awesome. even like gambling, for example, you know, I mean, a, a little bit of, 
a little bit of the unknown in life can be fun, right? A little adventure, yeah. a little excitement, nothing wrong with that. But when it's like, mm-hmm. okay, my family's whole livelihood on this next spin, you know, like, I mean, I don't even Bad think idea. there's necessarily anything like, you know, you're walking through a casino, you throw a buck in a machine, like, hey, look, whatever, and then you move on. But even in myself, like, we went once for a friend's bachelor party thing, which was a good one, not a bad one and all that, but we're at the casino, and I'm like, maybe one more, and then I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I, <laughs> I turned myself into my friends. The first only time I was ever in a casino, I'm like, apparently I could be a gambling addict pretty easily. But, yes, I mean, my, but thank, yeah. thank, thank God that, you know, by grace, I saw that early enough to have it not become, <laughs> like... Yeah, yeah, but praise I, God. But I, I feel like I really, I personally really appreciate that, that ability that we all have, you know, except for the grace of God, there go I, right? Kind of thing. Right. Of, yeah. And that's what's so wonderful for me. I know about this, this great divorce book is every single one of these characters. Mm. I'm like, Oh, I've, I've been on that path before. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. How fascinating <laughs> that C.S. Lewis pulls out all these characters. And I'm sure, you know, there, there's some more, maybe more than others that are his own. Like that's mm-hmm. me. In fact, a couple of times he actually says, I was hanging on the answer because I felt my whole destiny was wrapped up in this choice. Right. Um, by the way, going backwards, I love your analogy. Yeah. And I, I haven't heard that before of the, uh, of the contained fire that radiates yeah. and draws people in and the other. So that's a, that's a hashtag well, if, Mike Creevy right there. I was going to say, if I own. did come up with it, anyone listening to this, feel free to use it. And you don't even have to attribute it. So, cause I probably nice. stole it at some point from somebody. <laughs> well, you know, oh. it's all in the, on the great web of uh, the cosmos. We just, you that's know, right. vibrations are everywhere. That's right. Um, yeah, I think, that, again, that's things being properly ordered. That's the proper hierarchy. Um, and these are words that are, you know, scary to a sort of Marxist communist sort of uh, ideology today that, you know, mm. well, a hierarchy, what, a order, uh, that kind right. of way. No. So, um, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And in the centerpiece of all that, Mike, is, as you said, like f- freedom. And I love the great divorce because none of these shining spirits really overwhelm i mean you know the the herd of unicorns that that flushes the woman out of the bushes still doesn't doesn't um trample her over right there's like this call to make a choice uh Mm -hmm. so but nobody's really strong-armed into it because that's god is a gentleman he's going to ask and he's going to respect freedom um which man it really that's one of the things in this book that uh you just get such a, a spotlight on the incredible gift of human freedom. Hmm. And it's like, you're, you're saying to yourself, you're kind of rooting for the, the solid people. And you're, you're like, come on, you ghosts, you knuckleheads. Right. And then you, you step back and you say, I think I'm a ghost. You know, I think yes. I'm one of these people. What have I been doing with my yeah. freedom? What am I so afraid of? Why am I so self-conscious yeah. or contr- such a control freak? Just such an illuminating book. I mean, on so many levels. Well, and that's something I'm, I'm kind of bookmarking things as I go because there's something I want to bring up a little later from The Last Battle also that has more to do mm. with the, the psychology of damnation, which, you know, and I'd, I'd, mm. love to, I'd love to explore maybe some of these same themes at some point with you in the future, you know, sort of yeah. plug this for, in, in, uh, in, in, in Tolkien, for example, because I'd, I'd love to go oh, deeper yeah. into that too. But, uh, but this, there was Absolutely. one point in here where he said this, and I, I loved, I just had it here. This was just chilling. When, he, when McDonald and him are talking and uh, this idea of, of mm-hmm. the, the real possibility of damnation. And he says this, mm. um, he says, uh, they terrify lest they should fear when the debris oh, yeah. of a decayed human soul finds itself crumbled into ghosthood and realizes I myself am now that which all humanity has feared. I am just that cold churchyard shadow, that horrible thing which cannot be yet somehow is. Then, to terrify others appears to it an escape from the doom of being a ghost, yet still fearing ghosts, fearing even the ghost it is, for to be afraid of oneself is the last horror. I, I, I heard, the, so the, the most recent time I heard that before reading it now was listening to the audiobook, and I'm driving, and I literally get chills. And I'm just yeah. like, oh, you know, that, that idea of, of being, you know, this, this shell of what a human being was meant to be, you know. It's... Yeah, that's the kind of that's what I meant. I think at the start of our our chat here, Mike, about him humanizing everything and making it so tangible and so real. Mm. I mean, d- just to say, like this haunting, this shell of a person, this decay, those are words that give us a visceral reaction straight yeah. away. We just, oh uh, yeah, because you know we've tasted it. Like you know, sin mm-hmm. is, um, it's an emptiness. It's a lack of a good, and we've all 
you know, drunk from that in some way, shape or form, we've sinned. We've also, I've sinned, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh gosh. And I feel hollowed out, scraped clean, yeah, betrayed. I, it's almost like the inner war, you know, I, it's the golem moment of like, mm -hmm. you know, my Smeagol, my golem, which, which am I? I've lost myself. I can't say the sacred yeah. word anymore. I, myself, right. in the light of God. Now I, I'm like the unman, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Nazgul. school. Now I'm slipping into Tolkien. So we get rid of all this. Part yeah, two. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Cause Tolkien does the same thing. I mean, these, yeah. these two, these two great friends love these great themes as Christians and as a Catholic mm -hmm. and a Christian, they love these themes and realized because they saw it in the dictators of, you know, they, they saw it in the, in the Nazis, they saw it in the communists. Mm -hmm. They could see those who sold out and they saw the face of the deprivation of good and how e evil and haunting it was. Um, yeah. I, I just love it. I love it that it's a narrative form. So you see it and you're like, Ooh, I do not want that. It helps us reject, reject evil. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's clear. It's, it's not, you know, I think we land, we live in the shadow lands now, quote Lewis, yeah. Of like it's kind of this gray fog and well that's your truth this is my truth and we need that cold slap of no this is actually evil yeah and run away from that you know and this is good and aren't you drawn to that we need that fresh sure. approach and i don't remember i was trying to find the quote i can't find it here but uh listeners could and viewers could always consult my eschatology course with homeschool connections there's a shameless self-promotion but somewhere in there <laughs> is the is the quote um uh, that um, and I, I want to say it's, it's probably from Joseph Pieper or or, Car or Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict. You know, because I have a lot mm -hmm. of stuff from those guys. Uh, it might be a von Balthasar quote, but this, this idea of the damned, you know, that that uh, you know, if if that should happen, in my own journey, it would be because and only because fundamentally I said to you know Creator God, right, the origin of all reality, I mm. refuse to be what a human being is. Oh wow! Um, and and that's essentially because that's wow. why I, I I run into this I ran into this with myself. I'm, that's why I love teaching this stuff and learning about it first and foremost. Mm. Which, as you know, the best way to learn something is to be forced to teach it, and then <laughs> always <laughs> exactly. have that motivation. But but that's you know how I I think your average person, whether they're you know atheist, Christian, Catholic, you know a Christian specifically, I just think your average Joe on the street, if they even think at all about hell being a possibility or anything remotely yeah. approximating hell i think 99 percent of, of your average person on the street would imagine it as some kind of like place of punishment if you just didn't follow enough rules it's, oh, so that's why like this kind of this kind of book where, where you know you get this real like you said visceral sense that forget that's nonsense like just stop yeah, those for a are second. cartoons what oh. what we're talking about here is is the real possibility of you destroying yourself and that's yeah. horrifying and that's why like every exactly. one of these there's no you know fire brimstone red you know horns and all mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and for that reason this book is chilling to me in a few places yes. because it's so much i love more i love that I love that mike and i feel like this is part of that new apologetic that we need to today to reveal yeah. that you know, all the, you know, the church with its, you know, rules and prohibitions and commandments, like, get beyond that. It's really about yeah. becoming Christ, becoming, coming to full stature and being, you know, who you were called to be, right? What's that? Is that mm -hmm. Catherine of Siena? Become who you were, um, if we are what we could, if we are what we are called to be, um, we will set the whole world ablaze, something right, like yeah, that, yeah. like yeah. find ourselves. Uh, there's a great line in The Great Divorce. Let me read yeah. this if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I think it's, it might be McDonald saying this to him, but, uh, he says there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Mm. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. Right. It's like, uh, you know, I, it's, it's all him or it's all me. Yeah. He said, he goes on and he says, all that are in hell, choose it without that oh. self choice. There could be no hell. No soul that yep. seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, fine. To those who mm. knock, it is opened. Oh, I love that. And that, again, brings us back to this idea that heaven, hell, it's literally right here, right now. It's already yeah. not yet. It's present. And it's like, yep. yes to love or no. Yep. Thy will be done or my will be done. Oh, so awesome. So clear, well, right? And that, and, and I don't know, do, do you have enough time here for me to just share one from the, the last battle sure. that connects yeah, to? Sure, take it away. 
Take it away. Yeah, because that's uh, and just to summarize it, because this is, you know, the the dwarf characters who are basically these, you know, these these sellout type characters in the story, and they're basically mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. they've locked themselves in this this damnation by the end of the book. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Anyway, it's been out for <laughs> over what seventy years, so they should know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and they're just this sad. They're just sitting in this little ring, this little circle, right at the end, like mm-hmm. in broad daylight. And Lucy, the one character, feels bad for them. And, and she, you know, she's kind of like, you know, she's trying to show compassion and pity. And she says to Aslan, the Christ character here, right, you know, right. can't you do something for, like, it's just pathetic. It doesn't, like, there's so much joy going on. The last battle, like, really good guy, the good guys have won. And these dwarves mm-hmm. are, like, sitting there in a circle, like, and it's just pathetic. It's sad, right? And, and I love this, like, so Aslan proceeds to try, he shows to her why they can't be saved. And oh, he shows gosh. how it's, it's, they've just... So he offers them, like, he's, he's trying to, you know, reach out to them. He's trying to offer them food and drink. And they're just so completely, like, they're suspicious. Um, he says, uh, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. He came close to the dwarves and gave a long growl. Low, but it set all their air shaking. But the dwarves said to one another, hear that? That's the gang at the other end of the stable trying to frighten us. They do it with a machine of some kind. Don't take any notice. They won't take us in again. And it's just, they're just, like, they're so navel-gazing, suspicious. right? Yeah, right. and, and suspicious. They're, and you know, he tries all these suspicious. things, and this this the last little part that's so so powerful. He says, you see, he, he, all these tests, and other work. he says, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is only in their own minds, yet they are in that prison. And so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. But come, oh. children, I have other work to do. And that's oh. that chilling, like, it can't, your window does not last forever. <laughs> like, there, you know, we have a lot of time. Yeah. In terms of, we have all the time that's possible. He gives you all the time, but there is an end. (laughs) And the the, the mercy of God. God help us all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The mercy of God waits for us. But the mercy of God also says, choose now. Yeah. Choose now. I I love that scene. It's so powerful because from the dwarves' perspective, right, because they're always suspicious, they're in this dark little hovel. But to those who who have let Aslan in and given themselves to, to love, they're in the bright, blessed country, and everything is bright and shining in the sky. Yeah. It just it really shows you what um, what fear, doubt, suspicion, all all that flows from the evil one, from the serpent, mm-hmm. all that stuff he wanted to sow in the garden. It literally, you construct your own matrix. You put yourself in your yeah. own prison. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and that's wow. back to great divorce. One last thing I'd mention is because you, you yeah. kind of hinted this yeah, too, yeah. but that uh, the character said something to the effect of, you know, I don't, uh, I don't want your bleeding charity, and the angel character says, "Do oh. it. Ask for the bleeding charity," because <laughs> he's, <laughs> and it's like capital B. I want to say, like it's, it's yes. like, yes, you know, oh, that's the whole. That's point. what a great, what a great, that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the blood. Oh, I remember, crisis. I yeah. remember reading that for the first time, and it was one of those throw the book down and go yes. for ten minutes. Like, oh my yep. gosh, Lord, yep. that's it. He just, he just did that. Yep. In such poetic, powerful way. Well, Bill, I know awesome. you gotta, I know you gotta get going for now, but there's just scratching the surface. Yeah. But hopefully, you know, for everybody listening yeah. to this and watching this today, it's just been, you know, it's it's basically one big advertisement again for C.S. Lewis for the Great Divorce, <laughs> for, for you know, praying, and maybe we're recording this in, in uh, and it's going to release after Easter, but we're recording this right before Holy Week. So just, you know, yeah. in, as we go into this Easter season, especially if you're watching this uh, when we first release it, great opportunity to really, you know. Pray eschatologically. I can't believe I said that right in the first try. Um, which, you know, is, is fundamentally, yeah. as, as Benedict liked to say, all, all, all our eschatology needs to always be Christocentric, you know, and so all of it yes. goes back to Christ himself. So, Mike, thanks for, for having me on. And I want to echo yeah. what you just said there. I think that um, there's so much to, to learn from C.S. Lewis's sort of apologetic works like Mere Christianity or Miracles or The Problem of Pain. But don't don't dismiss these fictional fictional. Mm narratives you know these you know be it narnia or the great divorce or the screw tape letters wow i mean they take you to the depths of the spiritual life it's so beautiful and so moving and there's something to be said for this imaginative evangelization that lewis is a master of so so take this into your holy week as well because you'll you'll come out um a better person and i think you know further along on the path yeah Amen. Well, thanks Thanks. again, Bill, so much. We'll have to do it again soon. (laughs) We will. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks again. Yep. What a delight, as always. And I'm so uh, very appreciative for Bill coming on. And as you heard there, you know, there's always new show ideas and uh, (laughs) things I'm jotting down for future conversations. So we're going to look at Tolkien for sure. We're going to come back uh, to C.S. Lewis and and, uh, keep revisiting his work because there's a lot more we weren't able to even take a look at this time around. Um, So at any rate, 
hope you really enjoyed this here today. As always, make sure uh, to to subscribe, to uh, uh, like this content, share uh, far and wide. Um, and it just takes a little bit of time to do those things, and it really helps the channel quite a bit to grow which I'm trying to, to do more and more. Uh, additionally, I'm going to put some links down at the bottom for some of my homeschool connection stuff that I mentioned. Uh, so feel free to check out the uh, the links section of this video, and there's, there's going to be some goodies down there for you. God bless you all. Stay tuned to the channel for more wonderful content coming up soon. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>